Well, good morning, everybody. Mike here with Hardware Canucks. And no, it might not be morning for you, but I have to start very, very early. It's like 6.30 in the morning in order for me to beat some of the construction noise that goes on outside. It starts at seven o'clock. But anyways, what is this video about? A lot of you guys had commented in our previous air cooler videos, especially the budget air cooler roundup, which you can find up there about why we haven't covered downdraft coolers yet or what's also called top flow coolers and that content is coming but the first thing i wanted to do is a little bit of an education video so in this one what i wanted to do is set the stage so to speak for upcoming content and that is talk about the differences between downdraft coolers and your typical tower designs not only that i want to go into some of the considerations that you have to make for your builds when considering one or the other. Not only that, I wanna get into the weeds. I wanna talk about CPU temperatures. I wanna talk about VRM, memory, and interior case temperatures and how each of these type of coolers can affect that. Not only that, we're also gonna talk about airflow and what these things do to the airflow within your case. So I'm gonna get into that right after a message from our sponsor. You don't deserve a crappy keyboard. An average person spends about three hours a day typing on one. A good keyboard doesn't have to be an investment either, but when you find the perfect one, it becomes a part of you forever. That is why I've been enjoying the Extra 5 K4 TKL over the last two years. A gaming keyboard with fantastic stabilizers, pleasant sound dampening, so you can coexist together just fine. Lovely. The Extra 5 K4 TKL, a winning keyboard for now and the future. Check it out below. All right, with that out of the way, I wanted to talk quickly about the coolers that I'm gonna be using in this video. And yes, they're all from Be Quiet, simply because Be Quiet has within each of their lineups a tower cooler and a downdraft cooler. So first of all, there's the Shadow Rock 3. It's your typical mid-tier air cooler. On the other hand, you have the Shadow Rock TF2, which is sort of the downdraft version of that. Now, stepping up into the high end, Be Quiet just launched this bad boy. This is the Dark Rock TF2. It's a dual fan, pretty large downdraft cooler. So we're gonna be turning up sort of the CPU to 11, testing to see how this does against the more traditional tower cooler, the Dark Rock 4. So with that out of the way, I wanted to talk about probably the most obvious thing, and that's the design differences between towers and downdraft coolers. All right, so let's kick things off with the ins and outs of tower and downdraft coolers, starting with the most obvious thing, and that's overall design. Tower style coolers like this Shadow Rock 3 use upright heat pipes with a single 90 degree bend that bring the CPU's heat up into the fin array. They then use lateral airflow from a vertically mounted fan to cool things off and quickly evacuate the hot air from around that zone. Downdraft or top flow coolers on the other hand, well, things get a little bit more complicated and you can see that when comparing the Shadow Rock 3 to the Shadow Rock TF2. They're engineered for high thermal density in a compact form factor. And in most cases, that makes their design a fair bit more complicated. In order to move heat away from the core, the heat pipes actually need to make two bends instead of one, and that detour makes them a little bit less efficient right from the get-go. To compensate for that, a lot of manufacturers increase the fin density, which is pretty evident when you look at these two coolers next to one another. They also try to run a bit larger fans on their downdraft coolers, and that's exactly what Be Quiet is doing here too. But that added complexity does add a little bit of a premium when you compare them right up against similar tower designs. For example, the Shadow Rock 3 costs about $50, and it's rated for a TDP of about 190 watts, while the TF2 costs $10 more and it actually has a lower 135 watt rating. The other challenge with downdraft coolers is sometimes memory and heatsink clearance. While they can be placed in pretty much any direction on an Intel-based system or flipped 180 degrees on AMD, there's usually going to be some height restrictions unless you're using a lot more compact design, like we're seeing in the ITX market right now. I mean, most memory modules shouldn't have an issue, but make sure you check this beforehand and before you make your purchases. Now, when it comes to the airflow of a tower style cooler, well, it's pretty straightforward. When installed into the vast majority of cases out there, they're designed to complement the usual front to back airflow direction. That means drawing in cool air from over the memory slots and exhausting hot air 
out the back towards the rear exhaust fan. That technically leads to lower case and component temperatures since any heat generated by the processor rises up through the fin array and is generally passed out through the back of the case. And even if a hot running graphics card is installed, well, any excess heat coming from it should technically get caught right up and expelled too without impacting the CPU too, too much. So are there any downfalls to Tara coolers? Well, yeah, one of those is obviously height. They simply aren't compatible with slimmer cases, especially in the ITX market. And that's really a problem if you have a small form factor system and just don't want an AIO. Or maybe your case is like my PATX build and it fits an AIO, but only if you sacrifice somewhere else like the GPU length. And downdraft airflow, well, that's exactly what it sounds like too. It takes fresh air from above and pushes it downwards through the fin array, or conversely, it can suck up air upwards into the fin array. In some ways, that runs a little bit contrary to a typical case's natural airflow direction, but that's to be expected in this kind of situation. Remember what I said? There's sacrifices here. Plus, this kind of setup can even help with memory and VRM temperatures since there's an active airflow current going directly over them. And that's important in ITX environment specifically because they're pretty limited with the number of case fans that can be installed in the first place. And let's be honest here, any extra access to fresh air is a massive benefit in such a constrained space. And there's one great example of that. And I'm gonna go off screen and grab it. And that's this. When a case is slim enough that it brings fresh air towards the downdraft cooler, like in this Sentry build, it's actually able to suck in that fresh air and cool all the components around it. But at the same time, it can also technically increase some component temperatures, especially if there's a GPU blocking some of the outwards airflow, since hot air from the processor gets sort of funneled downwards and caught up in that area between the GPU and the CPU. But there's a way to counteract this though, and that's to flip the fan around so it's drawing air away from around your components. While pulling air through a heatsink is always, always less efficient than pushing, the negative pressure zone underneath the cooler can have some serious benefits for things like VRM, memory, and even components mounted on the GPU's back. If you have a ventilated side panel, like I mentioned before, this can quickly remove CPU heat so it doesn't stick around in the case causing all sorts of problems. So obviously there are a ton of use cases for downdraft coolers, but I had a question and we had a debate here in the office the other day. Why would somebody want a downdraft cooler in a situation that's not necessarily space constrained? And I came up with a couple of reasons. Maybe you guys can add to this in the comments. But number one is potentially lower VRM and memory temperatures. There's a lot of assumption out there that a downdraft cooler will lead to those components being cooled better. And I'm saying assumption because you have to see the numbers that we're gonna be putting up here in a couple seconds. The other possibility, and for me, this is a big one, is aesthetics. So for me personally, I like the look of a fan pointing towards the side of a case rather than just like a plain Jane heatsink. Maybe you have ARGB, it might look even better. Now on the other hand, there it might be a little bit of a niche scenario where you have a slightly smaller case that brings a vertical GPU right over the CPU socket and you might not have the vertical space in order to mount a typical tower cooler. In that case, you might not want an AIO and boom, you can actually put potentially a downdraft cooler there. Like I said, if you guys have any other reasons, by all means, let me know. Now, what I wanted to do is take all of those theories and put them into practice. So this is basically what I've gone and done. The test system is in a closed NZXT H510 with a single 120 millimeter fan at the front and another one at the back, both running at 1000 RPMs. Meanwhile, the CPU is an AMD Ryzen 9 5950X set to run at a constant 125 watts. I'll be logging a couple of constant temperatures after 30 minutes of a full CPU load. So basically the processor, the memory and the VRM are taking directly from their internal sensors and reported by HW Info. And just a small note about GPU temperatures because I know you guys are gonna ask about that. So when gaming, there was absolutely no difference between any of the downdrafts versus any of the tower heat sinks. There wasn't a difference in temperatures or in clock speeds or even component temperatures on the GPU itself. And I think there's a reason for that. That's because the vast majority of games out there, they just don't put a heavy load on the CPU. So the CPU temperatures, doesn't matter if it's in a downdraft or tower situation, they just 
aren't high enough to impact the GPU. And the GPUs these days have typically incredible cooling. Anyways, let's start off with the Shadow Rock 3 since it's a fairly typical tower cooler. In this case, the 5950X hit just 71 degrees and the memory and VRMs leveled out at just 37.1 and 55 degrees respectively. Both ambient temperatures were pretty close to one another too with the top thermal couple reporting just 27 degrees while the lower one got to just 3.5 degrees above ambient. And now that we have something to compare it to, let's talk about the Shadow Rock TF2. CPU temperatures in this case were pretty comparable to the Shadow Rock 3 with it hitting just 3 degrees higher, but remember what I said about the potential for lower memory and VRM temperatures from downdraft coolers? Well, that didn't happen here at all. Instead, they both climbed up by 4 degrees. Look, my theory about what's happening here is pretty straightforward. I'm running a relatively hot CPU and that heat is being funneled right towards those components. It could be that when using a lower wattage processor, you'll actually see some very different results. But look, that's just my hypothesis here. As for the case temps, well, they go up in both areas, which is exactly as expected for any downdraft cooler. That is unless you have an absolute ton of secondary airflow, and this case doesn't in the way I have it set up at least. Finally, what happens when you flip the fan so it's pulling air through the heatsink? Well, check this out. Processor temperatures do head a bit higher by 2 degrees or about 5 degrees more than the Shadow Rock 3, but both the VRM and memory temperatures are the lowest in this test. And that's probably because the fans are actively working to draw air away from those items instead of blasting them again and again with the CPU's heat. Meanwhile, the case temperatures, they sort of take it on the chin since I think the fans are now causing any of the hot air not sucked out by the exhaust fan to deflect right off the side window back into the case. This is definitely something you wanna be aware of if your case doesn't have side ventilation. With that done, let's step things up a bit to the higher end coolers, so the Dark Rock series. And the situation's changed a bit too, since I massaged the 5950X a bit, so it was running at a constant 155 watts. That might not sound like all that much, but this is one hot running processor. And all the other parameters though, they are pretty much the same as in the other test. So the first up is the Dark Rock 4, which is a pretty traditional higher end $75 cooler. With it installed, the processor leveled out at around 83 degrees. The VRM temperatures, they hit around 59 while the memory finally leveled out at 37.6 degrees and the two temperature probes I've hanging around hit 30 degrees and 31 degrees respectively. With that as a baseline this is the Dark Rock TF2 and I know what I said about downdraft coolers supposedly being a little bit shorter and more compact vertically. I mean sure it's a lot shorter than the high-end tower coolers at 134 millimeters in height and that actually makes it more compact than actually some of the 92 millimeter coolers out there like like the Pure Rock Slim 2 I looked at a little while ago. But even with two fans installed, it still has the space to fit 49mm high memory modules underneath, and that's pretty impressive. But the main challenges and complexity are the same as with all the other downdraft coolers out there. So it carries a premium price of 85 bucks and actually goes for more than the Dark Rock 4. And in comparison, the CPU temperatures were actually right in line. Well, two degrees hotter, but that's pretty much dead even in my books. VRM temperatures, on the other hand, they remained about the same in both situations since there's continuous airflow over them but the memory does jump a bit in comparison to the tower cooler. And case temperatures, well, that all depends on which one you look at. The probe on the top of the case ended up at 37 degrees, which is getting pretty toasty, while the lower one only registered a four degree uptick. But what happens when we flip this thing around with the fans pointed upwards, like I did before with the Shadow Rock TF2? Well, CPU temperatures are only two degrees hotter than the standard config, while both VRM and memory are actually two to three degrees cooler. And just like before, this configuration ends up raising case temperatures in both zones. Well, I guess that wraps things up. And if anything, I hope this video allowed you guys to have a little bit of a snapshot into the differences between downdraft and tower style coolers. Now, I hope this also provided a little bit of an education lesson and maybe opened up some people's eyes to the potentials of both. But if anything, I'm hoping that this sets the stage for upcoming content and it also helps you guys make the right decisions when spending your hard earned money. So look, I'm Mike with Hardware Canucks. I'm gonna see you in the next one and I hope you have a great day.